Casual Magic has been sponsored by Quiver, maker of the Quiver and Bolt deck cases and other fine deck holding accessories. Use the code CASUAL on their website for 10% off your order. We're also sponsored by Architect, the premier site for hosting your decks on the internet. I love them and they love me and uh, it seems like a good reason for you to use them. You can also support Casual Magic directly by going to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Shivan B. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to Casual Magic, the show where we talk about the fun side of Magic the Gathering. My name is Stephen Button. Casual Magic is brought to you by Quiver and Architect. Sadly, cool stuff has uh, let us go. So in lieu of that, you can support me directly at my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Stephen B because uh, I desperately need it. <laughs> Until we find another sponsor. Uh, yeah. But today I'm really excited because I have one of my dear, dear friends uh, on the you know, I guess it's a lie too, right? Like I always just have everybody on the show is one of my dear, dear friends. I have a lot of friends. However, this one's really special because like, I don't know, I've known her for years and years now and we just have a really great relationship that I just, I feel like every time I'm at a GP or con that you're at, you are like the last person I see before I leave and we have a nice calm minute before I go home and it feels great. Uh, I've had my friend here, uh, Cass Lynn, aka Devoted Druid, one of the co-hosts of uh, Brainstorm Brewery these days, but also just a person who I have bought a lot of magic cards from. <laughs> Hi, I, uh, I, I am definitely somebody that people know in their, their bank accounts and their wallets, <laughs> but also in their hearts. And I like to live in all those places because some of them, much like sponsoring you on patreon.com forward slash B. Uh, people have supported me over the years through my, my endeavors as a, as a vendor, but also just as a a player and as a member of the community. And now as an LGS owner, which is wait, what? when did that happen? Oh yeah. Uh, about August of last year. Holy crap. Congratulations. In my, like my local game store. Uh, that's wild. That's what I've been up to. (laughs) I mean, dude, that's a, you have chosen an interesting time to get into the uh, the brick and mortar business. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do the thing that you're not, you know, you you, you know, isn't the best idea, but it's the best idea for you. Mm, that's fair. And I mean, you have enough experience just in buying and selling cards and understanding the community. So it seems like you are uh, specifically, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? You're like set up to to do this sort of thing. I think so. I, I also am very fortunate to have jumped on with a team of people who's very, very competent and also a community that loves magic, loves games, and puts in the effort to build community rather than just needing it built for them, which mm. any, any community with enough fire underneath it's going to do. Yeah. I mean, it's a, community building is really the key in both store ownership, store ownership and in just like the game itself. Like magic doesn't function without a community you have to have somebody to play with you have to have somebody to buy from you have to have somebody to sell to you have to somebody to to bitch about when you're sitting there and saying like i can't believe they flipped over the blah blah it's like yeah buddy like life is hard i understand um oh my god can i tell you about something i literally did about half an hour before we started talking yeah hit me okay so uh i got i saw this random uh, explorer deck that somebody had posted on twitter and it uses that new ley line, the new four color ley line mm-hmm. from whatever Mur- murders of Markov manner. Um, and basically the gimmick is that it's a mono green deck that I basically had, this was my turn one, two ley lines and a sunken city. The sunken city is the land from Ixalan that says uh, it taps for a color and then you can tap it to add two if you're activating a land. That is important because my turn two play was Nykthos. Oh, now, yeah. Nykthos is like, you know, I'm looking for devotion. And uh, I've got these two ley lines, which are both four green pips each. So that's a devotion of eight. So, <laughs> so I tap a sunken city, tap Nykthos, get eight green mana on turn two. I use that to play the stupid um, Storm the Festival. Storm the Festival. Oh, yeah. Which gets me two. It's like a collective company that gets me two, like, five drops or whatever. And I get an Elvish Mystic, and I get the Kiora, the the blue green Kiora, the the hybrid one. So what that means is I now have a devotion of 
10 if I wanted to. And so I used Kiora to untap Nykthos. And because I had two mana left over, because Storm cost six and I had eight blue and eight green, uh, I tap, use that two floating to tap Nykthos for 10 green mana to put down Ulamog on turn two. <laughs> what I love about that story is that. Do you know who Bobby Fortinelli is? No. I believe he's a magic judge, but he's also someone who wrote like a like a, a 90 page or something primer on Pioneer Mono Green Devotion before <laughs> Car and the Great Peter got banned. And he was someone who was like super spiky at like trying to optimize every edge in the deck. And he mm. talked about his lines with the deck the exact same way you did, where it's just like, and then I had this much mana, and then I got to do this, and then I got to do my payoff. <laughs> And there's just something that will be always joyful about getting to do, like, go off and then use all your green mana to cast a big guy. Right. It's universal. It just, it, I, I both felt super gleeful that I was like, look, I got it to work. But the thing is, my OP had, like, they'd put out one island and tap to put out some random one-drop ninja or whatever. And, of course, I exiled both of them. <laughs> and they're sitting there. You could see the pause on the other side. They just, like, stall for a second. They're like, I have no lands. My one artifact is gone. And there's an <laughs> and They just called it a day. <laughs> and what do you do at that point? No, you don't. You just, that's that's the end of that. <laughs> Oh my god! It's just I'm sorry. Like that just happened, and I haven't had a good magic moment in a long time. Oh my god, that was so dumb. Um, it's good clean fun. People are like is it like, is it good clean fun? Look, when it's one on one, it's okay to be a little nasty sometimes. Yeah, like uh, like I'm a big doofus when it comes to commander games, and mm-hmm. I like to play my very idiot decks or whatever. But when it's one on one. I just want to play the dumbest combos I can that put the biggest, stupidest thing on the table and just like clean. Like I played a lot of that uh, runes deck that was out there, the mm-hmm. rune combo deck, just because I wanted to just go off, draw a million cards or like before that I played Corvald. Right. Like right. when you look at all my standard decks I've ever played or all of my 60 card decks are all very much like I'm going to get a crap ton of mana and something dumb is going to happen and you're going to die. It's all under, very one trick pony. <laughs> I'm under the impression that that we share this that we're both mana dork connoisseurs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm a big I'm a big uh, ignoble hierarch enjoyer. I do love me both the ig and the normal noble hierarch. Uh, I remember that was like one of the first big real purchases I made was getting four nobles back when they were super expensive. Oh my gosh, they were so expensive, so expensive. But it was just also like. I really want everything that card says is like something I care about. I'm like, look, it gives me bat mana. It gives me exalted. What else do I want in this life? Nothing. What else could you ask for? That's like short of flying, maybe a birds of paradise. I don't know, but like exalted. I love exalted. I just want exalted mana. Is, people always forget about just like how good exalted, is, especially when you get multiple exalted things. Mm-hmm. It just adds up. Um, so I'm building this Kadira deck that I've been talking about for a while. Uh, Kadira makes a bunch of small tokens, but she makes rabbits. And I was just looking at this list. I'm like, what could I put in here? And I threw in Sublime Archangel, which mm-hmm. gives all your creatures exalted. Because I'm like, the whole goal is to suit up this chick and send her in there. And then all of your bunnies are just like, by my power, you will, you know, build the Genki doll and go in. And so it just, I, lo- I love the idea of just this orc lady going in there and the horde of bunnies are just cheering for her behind her. It's like, yay. And she gets plus 30, plus 30 and just slams. I feel like you should get some, some bunny tokens that are like cheerleaders, like with (laughs) the pom poms proper. Yes. Yes. Assuming this deck works at all, that definitely what I'm going to do. I'm going to try it out first. And then I'm going to be like, Oh, I spent a lot of money for something that does Jack, but the idea is makes me laugh. And uh, that's fun. Um, So, I've known you for years, it feels like. Mm-hmm. And I've bought so many unlimited soul rings from you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. But um, how do you become a vendor? When did you get into magic? Because I know you used to play, you still kind of play like a high tier spiky magic in like tournaments and stuff. I know yeah. you like won uh, trios, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, so I got into magic when I was like seven years old. Do you uh, remember with- what set that was? 
Torment. I remember my first ever booster pack was Torment, and I opened a Basking Root Walla and a Foil Grim Lava Mancer, and I was way more excited about the Root Walla. Well, yeah. But in hindsight, be. Foil Grim Lava Mancer is pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, you know what? These days, Foil Grim, yes, uh, yeah. My friend Drew today was just like, I just got a Foil Grim Lava Mancer. I'm like, swell, I guess. The, the OG one just looks like a cool magic card. Like, that to me is like what a cool magic card looks like. It is. I mean, Grim Lava Mancer, like, I'm weirdly tainted because like I discovered it when it was reprinted later. Like I missed mm-hmm. the torment one and the reprint one just looks doofy and I never liked its art. And then I saw the original and I was like, wow, this is a, when I was a kid, I would have been all up in that one with the weird, just kind of lava blooping around. Uh, it's a cool looking card. And also just like the border goes with it perfectly and the foiling on it. Oh, the foiling on it is so nice. Oh yeah. Like Drew just picked up the, fo- the foily one and it's so, there's something about Torment foils. Something about yeah. the Torment Judgment era foils that just look unbelievably sick. Like, Avon Trooper is like the sickest looking foil ever for yeah. the, a card that is complete dog crap. <laughs> I, one of my uh, dear friends, I don't know if they still have it because it was a couple years ago that I last saw the, the cube, but they had a, an, an invasion block cube. It was all foiled out that they built way before any of the cards were worth anything. Oh man. And some of the worst cards you've ever seen <laughs> that are just like the prettiest foils. And you're just like, I'm paying six mana to make like a three, three that changes a land type, but it's foil. <laughs> and it's like the best card in the cube. <laughs> and then your opponent plays the sphere monger because there's one of each card from the block in the cube and you just die because they, they got the good rare. <laughs> God, dude, you know, there's something about playing set where, you know, like 40% of the set is just complete crap. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. It, it, it definitely felt a lot more um, challenging to make, like, I'll be honest. I miss the days when you had to struggle to figure out what your 20 to 23rd pick in a, a draft was going to be. Cause like you knew it was going to be just some like wall or some random artifact. That's like, all walls within a 10 mile radius have banding now. It's like, what, why, why does this, why did you make this? Who knows? I, I actually talk about this a lot with players at the store where they're talking about like, well, you know, every card is so good. These days there's so few unplayables and limited. And it's like, well, yes, that's probably a good thing. But also I understand where you're coming from because I, I have played a lot of three mana two twos with no text in my day. Right. Just like a desperation two two is like a good clean magic. Like like Windrake, it, it doesn't do a lot, but it wins a game once in a while. Slowly. Nice. You just have nostalgia for bad things, and that's okay. <laughs> it is funny though when you see like the throwbacks and then like all the zoomer kids are like, why is this why is it this surely there's something to do with this card. This card can't just be ambiently bad and it's like no no it really can it really does just suck like every set had like two auras that were just never played in any deck that everyone got one of at one point as a last pick yeah just like why why does why do we need this card who who wants this card it's i don't understand but here we are uh i don't know this is just some weird like invigorating falls from torment was a random card which is two green green says you gain life equal to the number of creature cards in all graveyards that's cool. I guess. I mean, it's a graveyard set. I guess it's fine, but it's also like, really? You want to draft that? Like compare that to like Nod of the Bone and Innistrad, <laughs> right? Which is like Nod of the Bone is like you know freaking BDM's pet card. Uh, it took me way too long to appreciate graveyards, but yeah. So you learned in Torment and you started playing. Yes. And um, sorry, I totally got off on Torment. Down it's fine. I'm into Torment's it. Such a it's such a weirdly good set. But yeah, Root Walla and Grim Lava Mantra are great cards. Yeah. Like, and as you can imagine why I got hooked. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've been playing basically on and off ever since. Um, I got into vending because I had dropped out of college and I had a bunch of magic cards and I was trading back when trading was a thing. Mm. And I was just like, well, you know, I probably have enough cards that I could maybe try and start selling some of them and started doing that for years and kind of paid my bills and kind of didn't sometimes. And then <laughs> one day I got up through a networking opportunity that I'd made at, at going to Grand Prix and buying and selling cards to vendors. I got an opportunity to buy for a booth at shows. And that was kind of the first jumping on point for me where I, I would, I would go to the, the, the Grand Prix when those existed and get in the booth mm-hmm. and for 36 hours over three days, buy people's cards. So I want to talk about that a little bit more um, because 
I don't, that's something I think a lot of people don't really understand. It's like, how do you get into like, like I understand you, you know, trading cards and stuff like that back and forth, but like buying a card means you have to sit and stare at it and figure out if it's fake or real, figure out how much it's worth. Like, like if I come to you, like basically you and like DJ are the only people I sell cards to anymore. And I will go to you guys with a stack of like, I don't know, whatever crap I've collected. And I'm like, please give me something for it. How do you know what's good or not? Or like what anything is worth? I mean, it's a lot harder these days because there's a lot more cards back. Back when I first got into buying at shows, it was easy enough to just kind of memorize all of the relevant prices. Um, and now, you know, we use we use a lot of digital resources, but some amount of it is just 10 plus years of experience and rote heuristics of, hmm. I know that these cards are going to be worth something. Um, these cards are probably not, but I still need to look up some of them. <laughs> um, and we, you know, we... we Every business that we work for has a different backend sort of setup, but sometimes we just have like a full list of prices. Sometimes we have, you know, things that just like query uh, like TCG Player's API or something and pull up a, a price list for us. Hmm. And that technology has gotten a lot better over the years. Yeah, because I mean, I'm guessing in the old days you had to sit and just kind of learn every random meta that you were in and figure out, yep. oh, it seems like a lot of people in this place want to buy these cards. So maybe next time we come here, I'll bring more force of natures or something. Um, nobody ever played force of nature. Uh, but no, I mean like, so when you're working in those booths and stuff, are you like an independent contractor or are you working for them? Uh, independent contractor. Yeah. Mm. Um, there are but, a couple of people I think who are like proper on the payroll who are actually with the company. Yeah. But you're like buying on their behalf though, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like a hairdresser where you're renting this, the, this chair and then just doing your own thing within that space. Right. Yeah. No, I don't think there's any vendor that would let you do that because it is, it is tough to get a spot at shows. It is yeah. expensive to have a spot at shows. Dude, even like, I, cause I was talking to loading ready run and they're like, yeah, man, tables do not come cheap when you have yeah. to like sell your merch and stuff. And that's cause I was like looking, I'm like, Hey, maybe I should get a table for some random idea I had in my head. And he's like, no, no, you really shouldn't. Cause you will immediately lose all of your money on that. And I'm like, right. Fair. I remember um, this was years and years ago when the numbers are, I'm sure, much larger and scarier now, but it was like, my, my boss told me like, once we have done, I think it was like $30,000 in business, both in buying and selling, we'll have broken even on like the cost of the booth and our flights for staff and then everything else we still have to do. And it was just like, that's such a staggering number. That is such a large, that's so many cards. <laughs> right. And so, you know, it, I think there are a number of shows where these these booths do lose money, but um, in the words of one of my my wise mentors and former employers, uh, life is one long session. And so sometimes you got to take the good with the bad. Yeah, but that's just, it's so, I mean, like, we never think about the logistics of this, but think about how heavy, I mean, I, I'm speaking to the audience here, obviously, you know, but like, think about how heavy all these cards must be. Like dragging flats and flats and flats of cards back and forth to shows, just aside from the man hours, it's just like shipping that stuff is heavy. Yeah. These things uh, add up. Something that I am acutely aware of is how much uh, 3 million magic cards weighs. Because at one point I had 3 million bulk magic cards in my home. Jesus Christ. Um, and when I when I moved, I had to move all of them out because I didn't have time to process all of them and like sell the bulk. Uh, and uh, my, my back is acutely aware of how much <laughs> 5,000 magic cards weigh at a time. Oh, God. Yeah, you must have this. There's the long flat boxes and just... Yeah, dude, I have a 5,000 uh, box that I've got in my uh, in my storage of like random cards or whatever, and it's full. And I'm like, every time I look at it, this box just gets heavier. <laughs> it's so yep. heavy. Uh, I realized that, and I started just putting my things into long boxes instead. But at the same time, these smarter ideas just not carry all that, just not have this bulk. So I gave 80% right. of it away. Uh, I should have sold it, but my friends were more like, you need to just put this on the sidewalk and walk away. And I'm like, no, my cards. And yep. like stop. Okay. I made a personal resolution uh, sometime last year after I bought into the current business I'm with that my personal magic collection could never be more than a five row. Mm. I just needed, I needed that space back in my life. Yeah, seriously. Uh, I, um, I hear that from my wife regularly. Let's say <laughs> uh, she's like, yeah. So um, when are those cards not going to be here? And I'm like, mm. Mm. soon. <laughs> We will get right on that uh, someday. I will have to go to TOA and say, like, here, can you take this box of things? And he'll be like, no. And I'll be like, oh. 
<laughs> yeah, that is, I think, one of the most disappointing things. Like when you go up, when when I go up to like a booth or something, and I'm like, I've got all these cards I've been collecting, and I'm sure they're worth something. It's like, no, they're worth something to you. Nobody else wants his Drek. And I'm like, right. oh no. Yeah, heartbreaking. Um, but w- when somebody comes up to you with a giant flat and they're like, I'm going to sell all this stuff. Like, do you just crack your knuckles and just start counting? Or how do you how do you deal with somebody coming up to you with like 5,000 cards at a store or at a show? So, so there's, there's a couple, couple different textures of those 5,000 cards. If it's all bulk, it's super easy. We can just, you know, count the rows and I know how many cards fit into a row when they're packed tight and that that's easy enough. Um, so now someone will come up with bulk rares and it'll be like half a row. And a fun trick is uh, if you take a magic card um, lengthwise and stack up cards, I think it's about 200 cards up to the top of a card. Mm-hmm. And so you can count cards that way. Oh. Or if it's just 5,000 cards that I have to price out and put on the buy mat and like do it, <laughs> I crack my knuckles and I get to get them because... <laughs> I actually prefer buys that are like that, that are just like a big box of cards where I can sit down and talk to the person for three and a half, four hours. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, I mean, I think one, that's fair. Yeah, go ahead. One of my first shows, I actually was kind of in a spot in the booth where I was like on the express lane <laughs> and people would just finish their mystery booster draft, come to me. I would like pull out the five <laughs> cards anywhere worth something and be like, I can give you $14. <laughs> and I would go back, give them money and they would go away. And then another person would come in and I just like had a constant line and I was moving and shaking and, that was productive and it wasn't particularly hard, but it was also not engaging. And the worst thing I can be at a show is bored. Yes. That's why I always really try not to waste your time. I like, cause like when I come and hang out, I'm like, I want to sit and I want to talk and I want to just chill and let's have a conversation. So I try to bring you like a hundred cards or something that we can sit and just, yeah. and you can go and give me 70 of them back. Well, I remember um, it was one of the Vegas's you came up and we did a trade and I didn't know what you were getting. Yeah. Um, and I gave you the credit voucher and later on Twitter, I saw that you had gotten the, uh, I think it was the beta soul ring, right? Yes. And I, if I had known that's what you were doing, I would have been like popping off the whole buy. Oh my God, dude. I, that, that day I would, my goal was to try to get a to try to bring in as much as I could to bring, get a piece of power. I wanted to get okay. any like cheapy power I could. And, uh, obviously I didn't make it there, but I got up to freaking beta soul ring, which is another literal life goal of mine was to get oh. a beta soul ring. And now I have it. And now, like, I remember I got that and I ran into Sam, our, our boy Ristic Studies. And he was like, could that, that was the first Vegas after COVID. That was mm-hmm. the Vegas between like normal and Omicron, where we were all kind of like peeking our heads up after like a year and a half, two years of like isolation and we're coming back to reality. And I showed Sam and Sam's like, look, dude, you're going to remember this forever as the the con we survived at. And like, here's your beta soul ring, the thing you've always wanted. And I'm like, I'm never getting rid of this. This is now just like, this is like my life memory right there. Right. I love that. Uh, Yeah. It's so fun. Speaking of, of our boy, Sam at that show, um, I think it was like the middle of the day on Saturday. I just finished up a a, like six hour consecutive buy. And I was taking my first break of the day. I hadn't eaten lunch yet. Uh, Lunch was sitting behind me. I just forgot to eat it. (laughs) Uh, And I get up to use the restroom and I walk by him and I have like a three minute conversation with him. And after that conversation, I just like felt a weight lift off of me. And I was like, oh, friendship, it has healed me. <laughs> and that gave me the strength to get through the day. And that's, that's honestly how I feel when you come up to the booth is it's just like, you know, you, you, even if the customers are all reasonable and I have conversations with them, they're not my people. And so whenever someone comes up and says hi, uh, it, it, there, there are long hours at shows like that. And so that's, yeah. that's what sustains me. That's like one of the things it's like over the years, you know, like we become friends with the people who like vend at shows or just show up at shows. Just in general, we just talk all the time. And like, it just become one of my just joys of coming to these things that right before I'm about to leave, I like to make my circuit and say bye to like a handful of people and just be like, Hey, look, Hey friend, let's like have our little calm down from this weekend of great, happy times we had relax, talk about life for a minute. And then just be like, all right, I'll see you in like three months. <laughs> the, next right. month. the wind down is like bringing in the plane slow and steady. Yeah. It's just like, to the Irish goodbye where you just leave and don't come back. <laughs> right. And then, but, the, but what I've learned is that that's the only way you can mitigate the con crash. Mm-hmm. Like con crash is real. You go, cause I haven't talked about this much on the show, but the idea is that like in Hinduism, we have this notion of like sansara, which, which samsara, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, 
enlightenment is is heaven it's like the purified nation and like when you go to these cons you enter into this state of like union with all your people there all the folks who were there are like there for the same reason as you they speak your language they understand they know the rituals you're there to perform they're here you sing a song they know the song that sort of thing and you're like you get this bonding glow of humanity of like shared like love of thing of whatever our purpose is to be together and you all get really just uplifted we're all happy we're all full of joy seeing our people you know like that notion of our people right and then you have to leave and go home and when you leave and go home we call it returning from santar to earth and you're like oh no all the mundane reality of like my job my life my family all the things that suck in the world that were gone for the weekend are now crushing down on me and then you just feel that innate just drop you feel that like you know soul crush and it's hard because we don't know as a society how to handle that anymore we used to have tools to be able to go to these like religious like events and come back and be like i've come back refreshed and clean and i'm back ready to rejoin society and so what i learned is the best way to like mitigate that sort of thing is when you're about to leave find people at these shows that you just see all the time and just be like yo how's it going check in you know and not like super excited but just like give yourself that deep breath that lets you exhale Mm -hmm. and then you can be like all right i've made my ritual goodbyes and i'm ready to leave and i'm ready to return to normal and without that you just end up uh, real miserable i think that's a really good way to put it is as an exhale Mm. because i feel like when i'm at a show whether i'm working or or playing i just feel like i'm taking a big breath in the whole weekend yeah and i'm building and building and building and then at the end of the weekend you know when you try to hold your breath have you take a, a big breath in before it's like it feels harder almost to yeah. hold your breath i feel like you need that exhale exactly. to get to a baseline again because if you don't you're just gonna you're just gonna be at that full inhale that that tightness that 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 fullness that feels great in the moment but once the things that <laughs> yeah. created it are gone suddenly you're you left drowning. wanting more <laughs> Right. (laughs) That's exactly it. It's like, you need, like, we need to learn to exhale. We need to learn to be able to sit there and be like, all right, I had my high and now I'm going to have my, it's going to be, it's going to be weird. Cause like, um, are you going to Chicago? I'm not, unfortunately. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, Cause my wife is coming to this for the first time with me. Oh, wow. I mean, this will have record, this will go live after Chicago will have happened. So I guess you guys all hear this in March or April, whatever it is. But yeah, like I finally convinced my wife to, I'm like, look, I want you to come meet my friends. I want you to just like see what I do, watch a panel or whatever, so that I'm not like totally like, you know, I, I just want her to know what this other half of my life is like. Right. And um, it's a hard sell when it's like Vegas or like or Nebraska or whatever GP is at. But like Chicago is like, okay, it's a big city. There's things we can do. I'm going to come early and I'm going to leave early. And I'm like, fine. You don't have to stay for the whole thing. I just want you to see a day because like she doesn't, she, she plays magic, but not a lot and right. doesn't really care whatever the way to keep our relationship happy is to make sure that the hobbies we're obsessed about are our own things and then we yeah. have a shared set of hobbies that we can you know share together otherwise it would just be like bankruptcy but um <laughs> <laughs> that's real yeah but like otherwise though it's like you know um i'm super excited to be able to take her there and like to show her what what this madness looks like and uh yeah it's gonna be wild I so that's actually something I've, I've been thinking about a lot is back when I was dating uh now I'm, I'm married obviously and yeah the process of explaining to a partner what I do for a living was always so strange well it's like well so I'm kind of like a hustler but it's like a real job <laughs> like I, I do I do like retail but like it's online retail um I do travel 30 weeks a year but it's like not like I'm around all week. I'm just gone for the weekends, <laughs> always the weekends. Um, sometimes I have a lot of money. Sometimes I have no money because I just use it all to buy cards that I'm going to try and sell. Sometimes, you know, um, I'll go and play in a tournament and I'll come back feeling awesome because I had a great time and I did well. And sometimes I'll come back and I'll be miserable because things out of my control ruined my weekend. And it's just like these highs and these lows. And mm-hmm. It was always not even an issue of like them handling it. It was an issue of me explaining it. Cause like, what do you tell somebody your job is? It's just like, I'm a, I'm a cash money hustler. <laughs> what are you supposed to say? I mean, you, you sit and you fleece a bunch of uh, muddled adults uh, every weekend and they come back every weekend at the same people. It's like, here, here's the cards you sold me last week. Can you please take them back? And you're like, 
for 30 percent. yeah sure it's like oh well, no dj always dj always talks about it as like we're we're magic therapists right <laughs> like someone comes up to us and you know we obviously have our margins we have to make to to keep the business afloat but it's one of those things where like the majority of the service they're paying for in that margin is the convenience of not having to sell the cards themselves which Anybody who does not have a business setup who has tried to sell cards themselves knows exactly how much that sucks. There's a reason I don't. <laughs> right. And the other thing is, like, sometimes you lose in a tournament and you're selling your standard deck to the vendor and you just need someone to complain at who's going to be like, man, <laughs> yes. you're so right. You did get mana screwed. And not even, like, in a condescending way. Like, that's just, like, you just got to make that connection, you know? Right. Like, you, we need a neutral third party who is not going to judge us that right. can, can just listen, just... God, can you believe I had that damn pod and then they thoracle and it's like, yeah, man, bad beats. Uh, that'll be $78. <sighs> okay. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to rage by myself another invention. <laughs> I, I remember one of, I distinctly remember this back when I was, I was trying to be the person who was like, I'm really good at legacy storm. I had just finished foiling out my storm deck and I, I put a bunch of practice in and I play a, a match in a tournament where I, forget that you can't cast duress on yourself. It's only target opponent. Oh no. And I wanted to duress myself so that I could get hellbent so that I could cast infernal tutor to find ad nauseum to win the game. <laughs> and I couldn't get hellbent and I lost. I was just like, I need to never look at a dark ritual again. And I sold the deck. <laughs> no, no. And I paid the vig to the vendor to buy the deck off me. And I used it to buy miracles and didn't enjoy <laughs> miracles, but I did buy miracles. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny oh my god um guy you know i can't say that i've ever rage sold a deck before but there have definitely been times where i've been like yeah yeah i guess it's because i don't play like the tournaments i play in are limited tournaments and people don't want to buy the bulk anyways um but then it's just like here take these rares and i never want to see them again <laughs> here's a jeweled lotus just get the hell out of here um yeah, I don't know. It's like, so do you enjoy playing in tournaments? I do. I love it. Um, I I really just enjoy magic. Um, and I enjoy the iterative nature of magic where like every time you play a game, you learn something, you can apply it to something new. Mm. And for me, I found that tournaments are really the best way to do that. Um, but it's weird because like, I feel like I used to be a tournament player who really cared about winning. And now I'm a tournament player who cares about growing. Hmm. And that's been really, really healthy for me. And I think that's something that a lot of tournament players don't necessarily subscribe to. Yes. And there's a difference between like, I mean, yes, you win and grow, but it's also learning how to take your losses and figure out what you can apply from them to the next game you're doing. Right. Right. Like, we like one of the things like my kid is now in fourth grade and he sits and he's a very bad loser when we play board games or card games or whatever it is. And I keep telling him, I'm like, look, dude, I play Commander. Commander has four players. That means I can only win at best one out of every four games, unless I'm really cheating or something. And usually even less than one out of every four games. It's because when you sit down with Commander Pod, three of those people are losing. And yeah. you have to learn really quickly to be okay with losing and to realize what your goal is and what your point is and what you want out of this, or you're just going to never play again. And you're going to quit right. and you're just going to be angry all the time. Can't always win. That's also one of the things that I really enjoy when I do get to play Commander or or Cube. But mostly Commander, actually, because multiplayer magic, I think, is really conducive to this, is in tournaments, mm. I never get to make the cool play. I always make the optimal play. Mm. You know, it's always like, well, this play gives me the best chance of winning, but it's not necessarily the coolest thing. And sometimes when I'm playing like an FNM or something, I can do the, the cool play. But when I'm playing Commander, I'll bust out the slow bat deck and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be like cycling artifacts in and out of the graveyard and I'll Mind Slaver somebody. Mind Slaver is my favorite magic card. Don't hate me. But I, I like Mind Slaver for different reasons than most people. <laughs> and I'll Mind Slaver somebody and take their turn and I'll be like, all right, let's, let's collaborate. What are, what are we doing this turn? <laughs> and we'll just like try and optimize their turn tournament style. <laughs> and like that's something that you get to do with only a card like mind slaver um, yeah I, uh, that and like kind slaver where somebody grabs you from outside the game and asks you to help them right oh man unstable by the way literally the best unset ever made uh i'm sad that unfinity sucked so much um anyways that actually that leads me to another thing you've sat there and you've seen a lot of magic come and go over the 
I don't know. How long have you been doing vending now? Like 10 years, something? 10, 15 years? Uh, professionally, I guess nine years, semi-professionally 11. Jeez. Um, so in that time, that means you've seen like modern, like magic change from being just 60 card grinders all the time to being people who want to bring out their 100 card decks. What's it been like to watch this kind of cultural transition? Honestly, it, it's for for the vendors, at least the ones who are you know astute and paying attention and kind of like looking at the data and talking to people and asking what they want. It's it's pretty easy. Like you just you see that Cyclonic Rift is selling more, and you talk to players who are like, "Ah, oh, Cyclonic Rift, it's too good. I hate it, but also I need one." <laughs> and I think from that perspective, it's pretty pretty simple. You just kind of follow the trends, and there's definitely some complications with like the way that Watsi's produced cards for certain formats. Um, mm. But I've always been someone who's pretty positive about magic on the whole. And so I see change as not a positive or a negative, but an inevitability. Mm. Um, actually, this kind of leads into one of, um, I don't know if this is the accurate description for this, but a long time ago, one of my friends was talking to me about angel numbers. And one of the angel numbers is like 656, which means that like something is coming that you can't stop. Hmm. I think it's supposed to be foreboding or something, but I took that and I always held it with me as like, it became like a lucky number for me because it was that change is coming and you can't stop change. So all you can do is roll with change. And for me, that's how I've always viewed magic's changing landscape is some days commander is going to be the most popular format. Some days standard is going to be the most popular format. Some days, legacy, never legacy. Never mind. Take that back. <laughs> <laughs> I love legacy, legacy, to be clear. Yes, so do I. Uh, rip legacy. Uh, but you know what, though? When elves is good again, legacy will be good again. I top four Eternal Weekend with elves. Do okay, you know about wh- that? No, what? So it's what? not really elves. It's we, we, call it, we call it cradle comrades or cradle control <laughs> as a joke. Um, I actually have... Oh, this is a good story. I actually have the deck right here. Okay, hit me up. Okay. Um, so it's is everything about that sentence I'm already in love with. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, the only elves in the deck now are Elvish Reclaimer and Allosaurus Shepherd. <laughs> everything else is just green creatures. But so it's, it's like, basically affinity without affinity. Kind of. Yeah. It, it's all about maximizing Gaia's cradle. Okay. See, I'm um, already on board. It uh, the 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 real big pickup for the deck recently has been Atraxa Grand Unifier as a natural order target. Uh, okay. Which is filthy. And Why don't you walk me through note, the deck? What does it do? Okay, so it has four noble and four ignoble hierarch so for mana dorks. Already it has Green Sun Zenith for a small toolbox of um, a main deck collector roof to shut off the artifact decks. Um, and the, the, one of the linchpins of the deck is Fiend Artisan, actually. The sacrifice, the black sacrifice thing? Yep. Black because we have a Gaia's thing? Cradle in play, it actually works as like. You can find a Crater Hoof Behemoth when you have a Gaius Cradle with seven or eight creatures in play. And so it's 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 a tutor engine that you can Zenith for, but also in some matchups, it's just like Pack Rack, because Fiend Artisan can find Fiend Artisan, can find Fiend Artisan, and like, how does a Lightning Bolt deck beat that? Okay, so Fiend Artisan for the kids at home on the audio feed. Uh, it's the, uh, it's Golgari Golgari, so two hybrid for a creature nightmare. It gets plus one, plus one for each creature in your graveyard. Who cares? Uh, X and a Golgari tap, sack another creature, sack, uh, search your library for a creature card with mono value X or less, put it onto the battlefield and su- shuffle. So it's effectively like birthing pot on a stick, kind of. But you sort can jump of. from a one drop to an eight drop. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. As long if as you, you have, have the uh, mana. Yeah, if you have the mana, then the, the Fiend Artisan's got the goods, right? Like, and Gaius Cradle's the secret. Well, not much of a secret, man. It's a well, <laughs> it's the special sauce, at least. I have um, I have two cradles, maybe three. I need to get. Uh, well, I mean, two of my cradles are gold bordered, and one is. Okay, can I tell you the the baddest beat I ever had in my life? Not maybe. beat, but like one of the dumbest uh, things I like the fish that got away. Uh, one of my first Vegas's, I was there, and I was like, "Oh man, guys, cradle! This Italian booth is selling them because I guess they don't want them in Italy or whatever." And he was selling this beat up one for like seventy five, eighty five dollars. I'm like, "Oh man, yeah, yeah." And I'm like, I hemmed and hawed, and that was when it was like a hundred, two hundred bucks in U.S. dollars. And I just like, I should have just bought them both on the spot. Yeah. And now they're like infinite dollars, and even the gold border ones are infinite dollars. And I don't know. Ah. Cradle I mean, Guy's is, Cradle. I love that card, though. 
it's it's one of my favorite magic cards actually and one of the the things behind this deck is um when i was a kid i was given some korean urza saga booster packs whoa and out of them i opened some cool cards and so my, my default basic lands in magic now are korean urza saga okay well that's and bad my cradles are all in korean <sighs> Which was my holy grail playset that I didn't manage to track down until last year, just before Eternal Weekend. Oh my god! Are oh. they are, are Korean cradles? <laughs> That's so they cool. Are, That's um, so cool. And the art for Cradle is one of my favorite arts in the game. I'm just gonna say, it. I'm it's gonna, so beautiful. I'm gonna flex for just one second, as this is <sighs> this is my magic holy grail. This is my Beta Soul Ring. Oh my god! I, I didn't know that Urza Saga had been released in Korean. It was the last set to be released in Korean before the extended gap until M12. Oh my god. I you see Mirage didn't get printed in Korean and the back half of Urza's block didn't get printed in Korean, but everything between there. So you have like Visions Weatherlight, uh fifth edition, fourth edition black border, um uh, Tempest block, and then Urza Saga. Oh my god, now I need to get a bunch of like Korean mountains from Saga and a Korean Sarah Sanctum. Okay, well now I know what I want. Oh <laughs> They're so god. cool. Oh my god, it's so cool. I need a second Sarah Sanctum anyway, so well you don't need, I don't need, I really want. <laughs> so, sometimes a want is strong enough that it's close enough to a need that we allow it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there are things I want. I mean, like my actual holy grail is like the easiest thing in the world to get that I just haven't, which is a judge foil soul ring, which are sure. like all over the place. But it's just and people are like, I can just get you one off a TCG player right now. I'm like, yeah, but that's not the point. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's it's like the hunt. And like it's also making sure that when the item is there and my money is there are at the same time. <laughs> like it's sometimes I have money and there's no thing. Sometimes there's thing and there's no money. But like I'm the type of person who like for me the joy like I could get all the cards I want, but right. it's more fun to work for it. Like I like a quest. It's it's not. There is something satisfying about buying cards online and having them show up to your house and opening the mail and putting them in your deck. But there's something way more satisfying about like trawling the booth at an event and be like, exactly. oh, that's the card I need, vendor, vendor. Exactly. Or being like building up a relationship over years until yep. someone's like, hey, I know you're still looking for this thing, and I'm like, yes, yes, I yep. am. And then you feel really good about it because there's a human relationship involved, and. Yep. Then I get another unlimited toll ring. <laughs> What's actually funny is I had I had come into a little bit of money and I was I said I'm gonna finish the guy's cradle Korean place that I had zero of them at the time. Mm. So I'm gonna do it. It's the last card I need for this deck to really be like complete. And uh, Michael Caffrey, the owner of Tales of Adventure, messages me saying, "Hey, I found two Korean guys cradles for you at the event in San Diego because a lot of events don't go to the West Coast. A lot of cards in the West Coast don't really show up at events until they go there." And I'm like, tell me your price. Let me know. I will, I will make it happen. <laughs> and then six hours later, he's like, oh, I found another one. What? <laughs> it was a very expensive couple of DMs. Yeah, um, it sure was. <laughs> and then I had three and I was like, well, I have to find the fourth one. And so then I had to wait till I came with a little bit more money. And then I just, I, I tracked one down through a contact of a contact. Um, That's hot. And getting your magic holy grail really does. It feels as good as it, it seems. It feels really good. I mean, look, dude, <laughs> like that beta soul ring like I look every now and then I open up my binder and I just flip to it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's real cool. Yeah. Actually, I might even have it right. Uh, I was actually looking through my binders for something earlier today and I found. Uh, oh, yeah. Age of Soul Rings. See all my 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 page of soul rings there, and stuff. It, the old school ones, the new school ones, kind of mm -hmm. like a nice little juxtaposition there. Into it, dude. It, I I love soul ring. I love that art, and uh, they recently did a promo that I need to get, which is the new school soul ring art in the old school frame. Mm -hmm. Like I genuinely hate that artwork of the stupid gold ring or whatever. However, <laughs> I need that. It's it's the new thing in the old, and if I get the old thing in the new, then I have the yeah. Um, someday I will play in a set that lets me use two soul rings. Like I think that's my dream is to play a draft somewhere of some chaos draft that lets me 
like some mystery draft that left me at two soul rings. I just want to have two booster, soul rings. Mystery booster proper let you do that if you open it two of them. And in yeah. fact, in the inaugural event, which I played in, uh, fun fact, actually, if you go to the Magic Wiki, the image of a Baskinger Walla and a Mana Crypt is from my seal pool. <laughs> um, in that event, dear friend Ryan Overturf opened two soul rings, uh, some sort of fireball and a mind shatter. And none of his games were close. Oh, no, they really weren't. No, but they we, really we finished weren't. round one and he walked to me. And he's just like, how'd your match go? And he's like, well, you know, I played two soul rings on turn one and then made them discard their hand on turn two. So it went pretty okay. <laughs> In the most Ryan over turf fashion possible. <laughs> Which is like dry as you could possibly get. His delivery is one of my favorites just because he is like. He's like him and like Peace Ali have this the bone dry, yep. just like they say the most like broken, demented thing in a voice that's just very like your uncle is at the store trying to pick up cereal boxes and you're like, What the hell just came out of What's your going on, champ? You good, <laughs> bud? He's just like, Yeah, everything's going great. <laughs> oh my god. So tell me about your turn of the weekend. You went to you got into the top four? Mm-hmm. So um, I started out 8-0, and then in round 9, I got paired against the person I had been testing for the event with for the last six months, who was actually the reigning champion from the year before, Oh, regular at my store, Jay Wojciechowski, great guy. Um, he beats me in the last round of day one. No. And day two is just two rounds plus a top eight cut. Because mm. um, the event was so, it was like 980 players or something. Was his legacy? Legacy, yep. And then uh, on day two, I win a match, realize I can draw my last round, uh, and paired against Bryant Cook, the hmm. epic storm himself, uh, what it has to be my worst matchup possible. And he <laughs> offers me the draw, and I take it so quickly. like I just like, <laughs> yes, yes, handshake, please. <laughs> and then they announce top eight, and I'm paired against Bryant again. Oh, no. Oh, and no. Um, we, we have to wait like four hours to start because they had to finish the vintage top eight before they could stream the legacy top eight. Oh, geez. And so we're all just hanging around the convention center. We all get lunch. And uh, Bryant was such a class act. He could tell I was super nervous. And he would just come up to me and be like, hey, just another game of magic. So super nice from that regard. <laughs> um, and we play on top eight. And the match was actually streamed. And you can find it online. And it is just me getting absurdly lucky turn after turn after turn. <laughs> he like thought seizes me, takes an endurance or something. And I just draw the collect roof to turn off his mana rocks in game two. He like thought seizes me again and like takes an ignoble hierarch. And I just like draw the Gadok Teague. <laughs> oh no. Uh, he beats me in game two through some excellent technical play. Uh, and then game three, I just like, what was his deck? Uh, the Epic storm mm. uh, yeah. with uh, beseech the mirror. Hmm. Uh, the black, 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 and a colorless uh, yeah. uh, bargain sorcery that searches for anything uh, with four mana or less. Yes. He found a song of creation with it at one point. I'm going to have to look up this deck list. That's a, that oh. sounds surreal to me. It is It is a, a masterpiece. And he's he's the, the guy who plays it. Like, he invented it and he plays it. And uh, That's awesome. I beat him uh, very through some very good luck. And then in top four, I lost to the eventual champion, uh, TK Strashen, who is actually also a local. He's from the Maryland side of the DMV area. And we had played, uh, we've been playing Legacy in the same groups for years. And it was just like a, a local domination of Eternal Weekend. God, I love Legacy. It's the it's the best format. And and I know card availability is always the topic about it. And it sucks that it's hard to play. But honestly, like, it's so fun. However, however you manage to play Legacy, you know, whatever that means to you, sleep up some cards, you know, play some games. Because it's so fun. Like, honestly, a lot of... Kitchen table magic that I play is basically legacy, but horrifically bad off meta legacy decks because you're just mixing cards from the entire history of magic. What else right. is it going to be, right? Like, come on. But for me, like, there's something about casting glimpse of nature and then just chaining off with a bunch of yeah. elves and just drawing infinite decks and then just slamming, right? Like, that's so good. Like, I, that feeling is so hard to replicate in other formats, except for like maybe Popper, where I can play Distant Melody or something. Right. I don't know. It's like, there's something wholesome about that. It feels fun to drop an elf, get a card, drop an elf, get a card, and then just like make it. It feels like Richard Garfield magic is what it feels like. It's just I like, here's a ton of mana. Mm. They, they just printed Orcish Bowmasters and I was playing Glimpse of Nature elves in an event and I cast a Glimpse of Nature. My opponent flashes in a Bowmaster in response and I just realized like, oh, I can't ever do this again. No, that, 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 that era has gone. And from that actually came like the fiend artisan, 
um, Endurance's main deck, like more mid rangey cradle yeah. deck. And that, that was sort of the inspiration of all of this. Um, For me, it was Fury. Fury coming <sighs> in and just be, uh, me being like, okay, I'm going to put a Dwine and Zelite and like, you know, yep. Heritage Druid and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, Fury. And I'm like, that. Oh, come on that's not sporting at all and they're like die and i'm like die <laughs> modern horizons 2 gave a gave to us mana dork with a little bit of black mages in the form of grist one of my favorite cards ever mm. and then took from us in the form of fury and then watsy made the correct decision to remove fury from modern so i never have to see its stupid face God, again i hate that goddamn card so much fury I, and grief are just <sighs> They, you know what? They were named correctly because that is what you feel when you see the two damn cards. It's actually funny too because, like, at first I was like, grief seems kind of like it might be interesting. Like, it's like a powerful you, discard effect, but I'm not against discard. Yeah. Boy, was it, I wrong. You know, it's just it's it's the thing that's wild to me is the stupid. It's a the thing I liked about that scam deck is that they took this card, this card type that is in every limited format the oh your thing dies and it comes back from the graveyard which is a complete garbage card that nobody plays like you know whenever i i am always impressed and awed when people take draft trash and turn it into just like the best deck you've ever seen and it's like what the who would have thought to use this garbage to turn into something amazing like i think we're, we're, go ahead I think we're going to see a lot more of that as magic sort of continues on because like we were talking about earlier with limited, there's just less unplayables in packs. Even the random commons are just like sometimes really good. Yeah. I think that's awesome that like you can just, you can make treasure out of trash. Well, I mean, do you remember like one of my favorite pro tours ever was, uh, there was one where there's in soul artifact, the one with the big mm-hmm. scissors on it. And someone's like, yeah, dark steel Citadel and in soul artifact, I've got an indestructible five fives coming at you. It's like, this is like a weird limited chaos draft deck that is suddenly just winning pro tours. And that's, that's awesome. Like, I love that so much. That event is the one where Ryan Overturf, recurring character in this episode, apparently. Yeah. I love him. I'm going to get him on the show as soon as I can. Hmm? He, he paid five U S American dollars for a keeper of the lens. What? Cause he needed one for his and soul artifact deck. Cause it was the best one mana artifact creature. Keeper of the Lent it was is the, the best one worst the card. That's like in my list of one of the worst cards ever printed. He played that in a pro tour. Why, why would you do that to yourself? I guess he desperation, just needed, man. Desperation. Yep. Well, I think what it was was he like he didn't have the good version of the blue, red, and soul artifact Shrapnel Blast deck. And he had kind of like a slightly weaker version. <laughs> and they hadn't figured out Thopter Engineer. And so he was just like playing a bunch of Keeper of the Lenses, I guess. So yeah, for the kids at home who don't know, Keeper of the Lenses is one mana card. It came from like Dragons of Tarkir and it lets you, This is it's a one mana artifact that's one, two, that lets you look at face down creatures. That is the most like specific, short of being one of those like all of your soul bond creatures get trampled or some garbage. This is like just real, real hot, like, Everybody had 400 of them because they went around the draft table and yep. nobody wanted to play them because they're garbage. Uh, God, that card sucked. And it was funny because it was right there with the Lens of Clarity, which was in cons, which is the same gimmick, just also bad. Worse. <laughs> Worse. Almost. Well, what's funny too is, hey, Keeper of the Lens looks at uh, disguised creatures now Yeah, too, I know. Maybe. I was going to say, I'm like, look, it's a, if they put that on the list, that would be hilarious. Oh, Speaking of the list, speaking of... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Tell me all your thoughts. Brian David Marshall. Yes. Speaking of Nod of the Bone, I lost to a Nod of the Bone in uh, Murders at Karlov Manor Limited because it's on the list and you can open list cards and play boosters. That is hella funny. It's sweet. I lo- all I- the list cards are like clearly super curated for the limited format because they can appear in play boosters now. And like, I just lost a game to a, a, a Nod of the Bone out of nowhere. And it was awesome. I was thrilled <laughs> about it. I was like... I- I think they figured it out. I think this new iteration of like, hey, we're going to put list cards in there, but we're going to actually make them relevant and useful instead of yeah. just a one-off waste or whatever the hell. Right. Like, I think that's so cool. I think it's like, I'm still not sure what I think about those boosters in general, but I think the idea of including a random like card from the history of Magic that's really good and limited. Like, I love seeing the bonus sheets. And I think these are yeah. a really fun way to just add some spice to the, the table. 
you know, they're almost like a spiritual echo of the bonus sheets in in that regard where it's like a little sprinkling of variety. Yeah. Of just like some history from a thousand years ago. And you're going to be like, what, what the hell is that doing in here? I didn't even see that. And Oh God. Oh no. And now I'm losing. (laughs) Do you remember, I I believe it was on coverage of somebody losing to a strip mine expedition in pro tour of the gate watch limited. No, but I watched it, so I probably do remember, but that sounds awesome. Uh, that that to me is like, obviously, that's one of the more extreme bad examples, but that kind of <laughs> thing is super cool. Yeah, I lo- like, I remember when uh, the um, when Kaladesh's set came out and you had all the inventions and people were just losing, like, you'd be playing a great limited match and then out of nowhere, dude would drop like a monocrypt or a soul ring or something, and you're like, yep. oh, well... <laughs> I guess I like I remember the dude uh, like I was playing an F and M and dude had cracked a sort of fire nice, which mm-hmm. in limited is just insane gas. Unbeatable. And uh that was that was sucked to lose you, but it was also delightful. <laughs> it's just really cool. It's like you just like wow, and then flash it on its bright orange, it's glowing, it's oh it's so cool. Inventions, I miss you. They are uh, so aesthetically cool it's like they're obviously special and i love that about them except for one thing no worm coil engine tokens yeah what's up with that it's one of my biggest pet peeves on the planet is that worm coil engine is one of my favorite cards of all time and they give me a sick version of it and it breaks into infinite tokens (laughs) like come on Come on. A good mm-hmm. consolation prize if we have to say, but still it's no, like, come but on. like, but imagine opening an expert or an invention and it's a worm coil token. How would that feel? Well, I mean, I, I would like that. I appreciate right. why other people would not, but then there are also people who are like, why is ornithopter in here? And I'm like, cause you guys don't understand why ornithopter is in here. It's amazing. And kids how these days. I, yeah, seriously. And people are like, Oh, this is going to be $5. I'm like, that thing is $50 now <laughs> like, sorry it's, it's held up as one of the more valuable inventions because people just like ornithopter it was a free spell awesome. it's awesome the, what's not to love it's a free spell it flies and it's beautiful what do you want like i actually i think you'll appreciate this story for a number of reasons um right before covid lockdowns in february there was supposed to be an scg open in baltimore a pioneer mm-hmm. event and i had just gotten my fourth antiquities ornithopter for my insole artifact trap in the blast deck already sold (laughs) and the event got canceled and so i never got to play with it and i was moving about a year and a half later and i found the deck and i opened it up and there was just this this like melancholy nostalgia confluence of feelings where i'm looking at these ornithopters that i was so excited to play with and i didn't get to because of the world ending right and then there was sort of just like this glimmer of hope where it's like i'll get to play with these again someday and i haven't done that yet but i still have them and maybe someday I'll get to play with my antiquities ornithopters. I love that. I love that. I love that. Love that. Love that. Oh God. I, I have an antiquities ornithopter. And uh, one of the coolest things I own is I have an antiquities card, an artist proof from Amy Weber. And on the back of it, she drew a pair of ornithopters. Oh, so sick. I've got like a sketch ornithopter from on an antiquities, like art proof. And I'm like, this is, one of the coolest things I own because it's one of my favorite cards of all time. Ah, mm. artist proof Thopter. sort of. Mm. Oh. I'm just thinking about ornithopter. Sorry, that's totally reasonable. I often ponder ornithopter in my spare time. Look, I have won a lot of games in my day where turn one is island ornithopter and then unstable mutation on it, and then I just start swinging and yep. it's like, what are you gonna do? Guess I'll die. <laughs> I. uh I actually have to play some old school somewhat recently because some locals have old school decks and there is just something that is irreplaceable with putting on stable mutation on a flying man and crunching oh, in there. And then you, in the middle of the game, you just giant growth and berserk it and maybe you've got a student. Yeah. Oh yes. Yes. You're singing my song. I think that's one of my next goals is to get uh, an alphabet unlimited berserk. Cause mm-hmm. I, I love that card. And every time it's a good story, it's a fun moment when you win a game with berserk and plus I still remember the day when I was playing against a dude and he went like, you know, um, turn one swamp, dark ritual, dark ritual, berserk, uh, dark ritual, dark ritual, jism. And then next turn, it's like, you know, a uh, berserk fork or whatever the hell. And it's just like, oh, well, that, that was short. 
<laughs> so I think Berserk is on like the list of maybe five beta cards or alpha cards that I actually would care about owning. Mm. Um, partially just because I love the play patterns of it, but also my first ever like high power commander deck was Skullbriar. Oh, Skullbriar's cool. Skull, I feel like Skullbriar used to be like the, oh, you're playing Skullbriar. Why are you trying so hard? And now Skullbriar is cool again. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a cool, I love the idea of just like dragging the tokens off and back on again. And like, it's just, it's, it's got a really weird and unique, Skullbriar feels unique. In, yeah. in a world where Commander is not weird anymore, Skullbriar feels like old school weird. Right. And it also like, it's aged really well with the, the advent of like flying counters yeah. and death touch counters. Um, and Ozolith and all this stuff. And another uh, use I found for Berserk recently is I, I I briefly built and then took apart because I optimized it too quickly. A Minsk and Boo Timeless Heroes deck mm. where I, in one game, I loaded up like nine counters onto a Dreadhorde Arcanist and Berserked <laughs> it, then attacked and then flashbacked the Berserk on it. <laughs> and that damage, that damage added up quick. That was a clean 40. <laughs> And so I kind of was thinking, like, maybe I should get a beta berserk. Is that is that does that suit me? I want a beta berserk. I really do. Because like I was playing his wheeler in one game, and he just swings out of nowhere, and just like, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm at twenty. I got this. this whatever you can. That's nothing. And he's like, yeah, giant growth, giant growth berserk. And I'm like, what the hell year is this? What is going on? Oh god, have losing you, to a berserk in 2024 feels real rough. Have you seen the standard picnic ruiner deck? No. What is that? So, okay, Picnic Ruiner is a creature from Wilds of Eldraine. It's a red Nicolas for a 2-2 um, that when it attacks, if you have a creature with power 4 or greater in play, it gets double strike. And you play it with things like Cacophony Scamp, which is a 1-1 that when it deals damage to a player, you can sacrifice it. And it deals damage equal to its power to any target when it dies. And then you can sacrifice it to proliferate. But yeah, when it dies, it deals damage equal to its power. And it's a standard deck playing 4 actual factual giant growth. <laughs> And it plays like pump spells that give trample, that put like monster rolls on things to give trample. Oh, I love that. Um, I I played it in a couple of RCQs and I lost in the top eight of one of them. And there is something where like I, I had a blue eye control opponent who was at 15 life. He thought he had the game fully under control. He like gets a little too ambitious and attacks with a creature to like try and close the game. And I attack with my like, it was like a, a, just, just, just a monastery Swiss spear with a plus one plus one counter. And I turn mm. three cards in my hand face up and it's like giant growth, giant growth, monstrous rage. And I'm like 13 <laughs> or whatever the math adds up to. And it was like exactly <laughs> lethal. And he was just like, I thought I was good. <laughs> you can do that in standard right now. Magic's awesome. That's, okay? the, that's all I'm saying. That's the, magic I, that's the magic I live for, which is just good classic. I turn it sideways, pile a bunch of garbage on there and you lose. <laughs> I'm like, what do you want? Or you hose me. You counter the whole thing. And I'm just like, well, I guess I lost. You know, it's just, I don't know. It, it's, it really does feel like magic has gotten fun again. Like yeah. it feels like we had a long phase there where it was real just salty and not very fun. The sets weren't, they were fun limited, but not really fun in any other capacity. Commander is getting overpowered. Standard is getting underpowered and also just boring and nobody cares. But now it just feels like, it feels like there's a wide open space again. And it's like, like I said, it feels kind of like we're coming out into the sunlight after being in the fog yeah. for a while. Like, oh yeah, this is really fun. This is really like the, the story I started the show with. That's really fun. Like right. I haven't played a, a, a stand, I haven't played a sixty card deck on Arena in like a year and change, and this was just like oh, on a whim, whatever. I've got wild cards to blow. I don't care, and it's I love it. I love it. This is great. Like I don't know. It it feels like all facets of Magic are finally starting to kind of come back around. I think I think this is like a credit where it's due situation because. I feel like not a not a not a month goes by where I don't see a new person announcing they joined play design. Yes, and I do yes. feel like play design has had a lot like I think we're really starting to see the full impact of that group. Because every set just feels like it has this like this nice touch on it. The cards are good, but they're not so obviously good. Like it takes us time to discover them. Yeah. And I feel like cards are just like fun. I mean, getting Emma on that team helps a lot, right? Or Carmen Carmen Handy. I don't know. And like, you know, Ellie and I mean the fact that they have a casual play design team makes me very happy. Right. The fact that they have a play design team that's actually starting to focus and I mean yes they're missing on some things. You're going to miss on some things, but like right. I think I think they're starting to 
to remember that you don't want to over optimize a card right out of the box. You want to give right. people something to look for. Cause like the, the worst is two lane and like that whole era of just like every card is the best possible card it could be. Like, why don't you make it suck a little and make us work for it? Cause that's what we want right. to do. You know, a thought I have, like, did you, you, did you ever watch the movie, the matrix? Presumably. Oh, yeah. So in the matrix, in uh, the third part there's a thing where neo is talking to i don't know whatever that god guy in the machine is and he's like yeah we made some like utopias and everybody hated it and people died because they were too bored and it's like that with magic design you need to make it rough and tumble and make people work for it so that they enjoy it if you just hand them the candy they're gonna eat all the candy and then they're gonna be like well i need to vomit now and (laughs) people should not associate your cards with vomit (laughs) That's generally a good marketing strategy is to the, the no vomit route. <laughs> oh man. It's so good to talk to you, Cass. I mean, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm just a really, oh. and I love here. I love that you're on brainstorm now. I think that's such a cool, uh, cool place for you to just be able to show off and have fun again. And it, it, it makes me happy to see. I, I didn't think I'd ever sit down and try and make content again because I kind of I kind of hate making content for the sake of making content. <laughs> and the only thing that gets me on brainstorm every week is just the fact that I like hanging out with the crew. And some weeks I forget we're making a podcast. I just like I want to I want to see Jason and DJ and Corbin. And I think if it wasn't for that, I would never turn on a microphone. And like that's that's why I'm here with you, right? Like the microphone's <laughs> on and we're talking, and I'm aware that the world is going to hear this. But like at the same time. I just wanted to chat with my friend. Exactly. Dude, this is why I do this show. I had this, I had the benefit of starting the show like a month before COVID. And then this is the only thing that kept me going through the entire pandemic time was like, look, I know that I will have an hour every week where I can talk to my homies and we can just flip on a camera or whatever. I, who cares? And I can just sit and I can enjoy the comfort of people who enjoy the same thing as I do. And we can sit and chat in a way that we don't get to very often because we live so far away from each other. So right. it's just, it's very pleasant. It's very nice. Ah, and uh, yeah. So if folks wanted to find you yourself or your things, where can they go? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at devoted Druid. Uh, you can also find uh, the podcast brainstorm brewery on Twitter at brainstorm brewery and all places you can find podcasts. Uh, and you can find my game store games mm-hmm. and comics paradise in old town fairfax virginia and at gcparadise.com that's really cool uh congratulations on that by the way i didn't know that you you actually became like a store owner that's rad or like a chunk of a store owner or whatever it is co-owner i think is the official title that i'm allowed to say good enough it's great it's it's cool man it's 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 good to have a real real gig um ah 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 ah. (laughs) yeah (laughs) the world Uh, etc etc anyways folks you can find me at gearport gears you can find the show anywhere podcasts are sold or at youtube every tuesday thank you to my editor dan and uh also you can find me on achievement wheeler love magic and on the chronicles of dragonlance podcast and at patreon.com for slash and remember my friends it's not magic without the gathering and we'll see you next time